Hey, uh, I'm going to invite you guys to grab a Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 13. All right? Matthew 13. Thank you. Um, my Bible was out by the grill because I was <laughs> rolling burritos and I was like, got to the end of that song and I started looking around for my sword and I was like, it's not here. Uh, so anyway, glad, uh, glad Wydell could run and go grab it for me. Appreciate that. Um, we're in Matthew chapter 13. We've been in Matthew chapter 13 since we started this series on parables. And so we started the series a few weeks ago. We talked about the parable of sower last week. Uh, David did an amazing job talking about the, the mustard seed. And, um, and so we're in chapter 13 this week, and then we'll be in chapter 13 next week. There's a special treat for you guys if you come next week. So just make sure uh, you're here. Uh, I promise you will, you will love it and be really excited uh, when you get here because there, there's a, definitely a special treat coming. Um, and, uh, and so... Uh, but we are, uh, we are in chapter 13. I want to give us, before we start talking, because we're going to, uh, maybe you could tell by that opening kind of glimpse uh, or scene, and we're going to be talking about this parable in Matthew chapter 13 about the treasure. Um, anyone familiar with this parable? Just about a show of hands. It's okay if you're not. Um, but but it's, it's a really short part of Matthew chapter 13. And there are a few short parts of Matthew chapter 13. And I want to look at a couple of them uh, today because I think it helps us lead into what it is we're actually talking about. Um, you'll, you'll notice in uh, 13 verse 31... Uh, we get to this idea of the mustard seed, which David talked about last week. But I want to I want to hone back in on this just for a second. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to preach a sermon on this, but but I think that there's something there's a nuance here that we need to grab and and take in. And it's it's verse 31. He says he told them this and another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it was the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour. That's a lot of flour. Uh, most of us can't lift 60 pounds. Uh, 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. Now, there's something here that I think is really, really uh, powerful that I don't want to miss because I think it sets up the context for where we're going to go. And I don't want to just pull a verse out of context and just present it to you. I want to make sure that we, we have kind of the full picture here. Okay? Um, and, and so... What, what Jesus says is he says that, that, that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which is really, really small. And it gets planted into the ground and it becomes this really large tree. David talked about how big things have small beginnings last week. It was really good. And how our faith, it's not about how big our faith is, but it's about what we put our faith in. That really matters. Really, really good stuff. But... There, there's also this, this hint in verse 33 about this yeast. And I don't want to spend too much time on the yeast because that is going to be our topic next week. But there's something really fascinating here about the yeast. It says, it says that um, this woman, she took the yeast and she mixed it into about 60 pounds of flour. And in verse 33, this word mixed is the word um, crypto in Greek, which means to hide or conceal. And it seems like what Jesus is trying to express and what he's trying to tell these people who are listening to these parables and listening to him tell these stories is that the kingdom of God is something very small and it's something that's very hidden. And in, until it begins to really make a large impact, you can easily miss it. That, is, that it can make a large impact, but you can easily miss it if you're not careful. And this is why Jesus says at the beginning of this, in the parable of the sower, what we talked about in week one, that you must have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so we come back to this idea. Again, something very small. If we're not careful, we will miss it because it is, it is hidden. And we can easily miss it. But then Jesus goes on and he... And he it, it's great. We're going to talk about four parables today that take up six verses. It's great. Um, in verse 44, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Also hidden. 
When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who f- took looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So these are simple things. They're, they're pretty... That, I mean, I don't know that I have to break that down a whole lot for you to understand the, what, what that parable is about. But, um, but I do think it, it's valuable to maybe look at this in, in kind of a modern context. And so um, I've taken that clip that we just saw at the beginning and I, I just created a little short film from that clip. And it's, it's going to be about seven minutes, okay? But I'm going to ask that you give your attention to the screen for seven minutes and watch this short clip um, about how this parable gets told in kind of a modern setting, all right? And then I'll come back up and we'll, we'll talk more about this parable. All right, go ahead. Hello there, how are you? Oh, can't complain. And yet we do. Yeah, very true. So what can I do for you today? Bit of a weird question. Do you know who owns the field over there? Yes, I do. Me. Pretty much everything you can see around here belongs to me. Including this pretty little tractor, as I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah, it's a very attractive tractor. Sorry, about the field. It's for sale. I'm sorry? The field and everything in it is for sale. That's what you wanted to hear, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Have you had much interest in it already? Well, I'd say there was much interest from you, isn't there? Yeah. (laughs) How would you think of selling it for? Tell you what. Why don't you pay me what you think it's worth? And if I agree, then it's yours. What I think it's worth. And not a penny more, and not a penny less. What did you tell him? Nothing yet. We need to be together on this. said then give it to him what everything beautiful How much do you want for it? 
what I need is your signature just here to complete the sale. Sure. Completely furnished. What you see is what you do. Sold. <laughs> and you'll be one in the deeds, I assume. Thank you. Well, I never told you my name. Oh, I always make it a priority to know the names of those I'm doing business with. And those I'm not. By the way, we found something. <laughs> I know exactly what's in my fields. Who do you think put it there for you? Why did you want so much for it? Sorry? Why did you ask for so much? It cost us everything. My dear child, I only asked what they thought it was worth. And then I'd decide if it was enough or if it was too much. As it happens, it was exactly right. And for what? A, f a field? I think you should go and have a look. And if you're not happy, just let me know. Sure. What can I do for you, young sir? It wasn't everything. Now it is. Now it is. So, what, what is the kingdom worth? I ask that question because this, this idea is so foreign to us, isn't it? I mean, how many of us feel that way about the church? And how many of us feel that way about our, our relationships and the community we have? How many of us feel that way about organizations and nonprofits that are carrying the name of Jesus around the world? It's the interesting thing is that this, this small group of people... At the time of Jesus' death, about 120 made up what we would call the kingdom of God. People who believed Jesus was king and Lord. And they followed him to the very end. And they, they, they began to just live life in this audacious way. And, and very quickly, this, this small group of people that was, was hidden amongst normal, everyday life in the Roman Empire and, and most of the first century began to just grow unbelievably and make immense impact, an immense like difference in the world. 
And so much so that they were causing like an uproar and, and people were being crucified and killed. And like massive amounts of people at a time were giving up everything for the kingdom. And then something happened. Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. They made it its official religion. And it was, I think, because the emperor believed in Jesus, yes, but also because he saw the power that would come if, if, if he could make Christianity the, the, the religious um, organization or group of, of his empire. He saw the political benefit of it as well. And... Now, so far removed from that, what Christianity has become, when it was this very small, radical movement of people following the way of Jesus, giving up everything for the gospel, has become a Western cultural norm that you and I, we see it. And we hear it, and yet oftentimes we miss it, and when we do see it, and when we do hear it, are, are not willing to give an hour of our week to it, much less everything. Do you see? Because... The kingdom, whether stumbled upon, buried in a field, or whether searched for tirelessly, when someone finds it, there's only one response. What can I do to take hold of this kingdom and be a part of this kingdom and be engaged in this kingdom? It's a really, really important parable for us in our day. Because, and, and, here, and, here's, and here's what I think has, has ultimately happened. And you can, you can forgive me. Uh, I, I've been praying so hard this morning because I don't, I don't really know how to convey this without maybe pushing some, somebody's buttons. But there is, this, there is this reality of where what we have created is a kingdom at no cost to ourselves. And the kingdom that Jesus talks about here is not just a kingdom of cost, it's a kingdom of great cost. It's a kingdom of great sacrifice. But it's a kingdom that is so beautiful that when called upon to make that sacrifice, you do it with joy. And it really causes me to wrestle in my heart. Because I don't know that most Western Christians are willing to pay that cost or even see the kingdom as something worth that cost. And it's because we've, I think, we've become, we've become too divided by the differences we have as opposed to being united by the blood of Jesus Christ, which he died in order to unite us with. We are so, we are so enamored with a kingdom that is built around our preferences and our desires and our likes and our dislikes.
that we choose churches based off the music that they play. And the children's ministry that they have. And the programs that they... And I, I don't think any of that's bad. I don't think it's... I, don't, I, don't think it, I, I think you were created with those preferences. You were born with some of that. But the sad thing is, is that you are more committed to your preferences than you are your kingdom. And, it, and, it's, and it's why we have, it's why we have, I was, I, was, I was at this amazing, amazing retreat last weekend. Just so overwhelmed with how amazing it was because it was the kingdom. As there were people in the room with me from, and it wasn't many people, it was a small group of people. But there were people who were from Canada and who were French and, and who were British and who were Australian and who were black and, and who were white and people from the suburbs and people from the, the, the no burbs and the people from like urban areas. And, you know, I mean, there were people from just all over and they were all and, and like we were we were doing like things that most of us would be really uncomfortable doing, like when we would walk into chapel in silence and walk out in silence, and you know we're so used to just walking in and talking to one another, and and I don't I love that I love that we just walk in and talk to one another I love community I I and I was kind of like it felt weird to me, and then we would we would we would sing these songs that I'd never heard before I never sung them ever in in at, at church never. Uh, and we would read the Psalms as, as, a, as a collective whole. We would, we would open up a Psalm and we would read it together. And it, w it was just something amazing to look around the room. I took a second. Every time I'd walk into the chapel and we were getting ready to work, I took around and I just looked around the room at all the difference and all the beauty. And we were all in pursuit of God together. And for some of us, it was comfortable, and some of us, it wasn't so comfortable, but we were all in pursuit of God together, and it was beautiful to see the kingdom of God together and united by the blood of Jesus Christ. I sat next to, it's funny, I sat next to, uh, at, at dessert one night, I shared uh, some, some chocolate cake and, a, and a, a glass of wine with the Anglican Bishop of New England. Praise God for that. Like... <laughs> That guy is awesome, uh, and he, he has Memorial Day lunch with Frank Gifford and Kathy Lee Gifford, or Frank Gifford before he passed away, and it's like, why am I sitting next to this guy, right? Like, I don't even, but man, it's just so, so beautiful to just see, and, and I just, I'm, it just strikes me, it just strikes me that if... If there was a culture shift, and by culture shift, I don't mean like moving away from the gospel of Jesus Christ to something else that, that, would, that, that would become satisfactory to preach on that would bring salvation, right? Because that, that, that's, that's not a culture shift. That's a different thing altogether. But I'm saying a culture shift of where like, oh, the music changes a little bit and the program changes a little bit. Like I tried to walk up here after the first song, it threw me off. Like, if, but like, would we, would we pay that price? Would we, would we, would we be willing to pay that cost? What if, what if it became more multi-ethnic? What if there were, Songs sung in different languages. What if it became nothing like what we think of it as now? Will we pay that price? And here's here's my only like the, the reason why I ask is because if I'm if I'm being honest in my heart of hearts, I don't have faith in the church that they would pay and that we would pay that cost. 
And it saddens me. It saddens me so much that the kingdom is beautiful. It's a treasure. And we would deny its riches. And it's here right now. You realize that? Like last week, David stood up here and he delivered an unbelievable message as I was gone. And I'm so grateful for leaders like David. But he's Mexican. Did you guys know that? (laughs) Yeah, and he has Peruvian parents and a Dominican wife. How crazy is that? Isn't that beautiful, though? The kingdom is here. You know that there are people sitting to your right and to your left that disagree with you politically. They think that whoever you want to put in office is an absolute heathen. The kingdom is here. You know, there are people who have more life experience than I can even, like, think or dream or imagine. And there are people with just energy and passion. The kingdom is here. Here's, here and, but, but it's subtle. And, and if, we don't, if we don't cultivate it, and we don't do something to help it grow... It will seemingly have very little impact in us or in the world. But if we will cultivate it, if we will help it grow, if we will open our eyes and listen with our ears and see it when it comes to be, we will see the riches of the kingdom and we'll give anything for it. Because that's the response when you see the riches of the kingdom. The problem is, most of us don't see the riches of the kingdom when we look at the church. We just see a culturally normative thing we engage in as a part of our routine. But if we would see the riches of the kingdom and not, not ignore the riches of the kingdom, we would give anything and everything for it to see this beautiful mosaic of God's people, of every tribe and every tongue and every nation coming together to worship King Jesus because he died for us all. And we are all covered by his blood. And because of him, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And there is no Jew or Greek or slave or free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. I just wonder what kind of impact could a little, a little group like ours make if we believed in the kingdom enough to pay whatever cost was asked or whatever we thought was worthy. You know, Paul, I don't have, I was, I was, I was praying through this this morning and and this just kind of came to my to my mind and um, so I don't I don't have these slides up there but Paul in the book of Ephesians he's talking about this idea of God's mysterious plan to bring oneness in the church Jesus in John 17 prays that you and I that we would be one as the as the Father is one, as He and the Father are one. And, uh, and what that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean uniformity. That means unity, which doesn't require uniformity. That's the beautiful thing I think that's so awesome about our church is that we have people who are Anglic- or from Anglican backgrounds, and we have people from um, Episcopal backgrounds, and Catholic backgrounds, and Baptist backgrounds, and Christian church, and Church of Christ backgrounds, and we're all here together. That's the kingdom. It's beautiful if we see it. There are so many things that that we would like to divide over and that we'd like to separate over. One of the major things that that the the early church separated over was race. 
and ethnicity. And unfortunately, it's still something that we often divide over as well. But, but this is a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3 that Paul prays, which I just think is so fascinating. And right before in chapter 3, he talks about the mystery. The mystery that is through the gospel, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ. And then he says in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel. I began to serve this gospel, this good news, by a gift of God's grace. God allowed me to carry this gospel. That, that Jesus Christ died for us all. And we're all family because of his blood. When we believe. So stop letting little things, little differences separate you. That's basically what he's trying to say. And then this is his prayer. His prayer is this. For this reason, because this is the gospel, because the gospel is this powerful thing that unites us, it doesn't separate us, it isn't something that we, we carry around and, and we, we only make convenient for us or, or cater to our preferences to make us happy. It is costly, but it is beautiful and it is worth the price. He says, for this reason I nail before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and how this love that surpasses knowledge. You know, so many of us are on this path of intellectual ascent. Where we believe that knowing more about God and having some sort of inspirational experience is going to create transformation in our life. And it doesn't. In fact, most of the time, all it does is make us cold to those who don't know what we know. But he says this, his love, it surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with. Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. We like to quote that, right? Like, I'll do immeasurably more than what I can ask. He's talking about uniting the church. What he's praying is that God would do immeasurably more than what we could think. We don't think that we can worship with people who are different with us. We don't think we can lay down our preferences or we're unwilling. He can do immeasurably more. That's so fascinating to me. Like, I may not have enough faith in the church that we will lay down our preferences for the sake of the gospel to see his kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. I may not have that much faith, but he can do immeasurably more than I can ask, than I can think, than I can dream, than I can imagine. According to his power that is work within us, to him be the glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here's, here's the, 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 I, I just wrote in my Bible, I just said, we need to pray this as a church. This needs to be our prayer as a church. We need to pray that God's strength would give us the ability to be rooted and established in his love above all things. To be rooted and established in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the love is, right? Right? Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love in this. That why we were still sinners, he died for us. So his love, what we are to be rooted and grounded in above all else, is the body and the blood of Christ. His love. Above knowledge. Above our doctrinal stances or denominational affiliations. Above our, our races and our cultures, we are to take off those parts of our identity and put on Christ as Christians and be united as one body that the kingdom may come. That the kingdom may come. And here's, here's the crazy thing. As I think, if we, if we will fight to see that grow, if we will fight to see that grow, I think 
people will come into our midst and they will see the riches of God's grace in us. They will see the riches of the kingdom and they will give almost anything to be a part of it. That's my prayer. That's my hope. Is that our church may be a church and our community may be a community, a small a small group of people that can make immense impact when it comes to the kingdom because of our willingness to give it all up for his glory, for his name and his renown, to stay rooted and grounded in his love, his body, his blood. That's why we take communion every week. Every week we take communion because everyone who comes to the table is a part of the family of God. Everyone who comes to the table and takes the bread and takes the cup is a son and daughter. No matter what race, no matter how old or how young, no matter how rich or how poor, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And when we partake at the table together and we remember that it is his blood poured out for us that brings us here, that unites us, I pray, I pray we don't take that lightly or let it become mundane. But I pray we always stay rooted and grounded, established in that. And that we live life out of that place where it is the center not just of our worship service but of our life that binds us together with all people there's a um, there's a song that, that came to mind to me when I was when I was praying this morning um, the song worthy of it all do you guys know that song Everything we can give him. You are worthy of it all. Our preferences laid down. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. Because you deserve the glory. The King of Kings deserves all glory and honor because he is worthy of it all. You guys believe it. sacrifice everything that makes us comfortable for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory God you deserve the glory because you are the only one who's come and died on the cross for us you are the only one So God, I just pray we see and we work and we strive to have your kingdom come in us, that you would be worthy of it all, that we give it all up for you, for your kingdom, for your name, for your renown, that more people might come to know the riches of your grace. The treasure of the kingdom. You are the treasure. You are what our hearts long for. May you be at the center and unite us in your name. We pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you, uh, whenever you feel led, you can 
move to the tables and take communion this morning. One book I want to encourage you to read um, is How We Heal Our Racial Divide by Dr. Derwin Gray. This is just one aspect. It's not the whole aspect. You're going to read this book and there's going to be things that you agree with or that maybe you didn't even know you agreed with, but you're going to agree with them. And you're going to see God at work in the words of this. And you're also going to read some of this and you're going to disagree with some of it. And here's what I'd ask you to do. I just ask you to read it. You're smart. I believe you're smart. But I ask you to just, to just read it and take it for what it is. Take the things that, that God says to you and reveals to you. And, um, and if, if there's something that you struggle with or disagree with, just pray through that wrestle with God through that but but I believe like something like that something like this will make us more more of a kingdom not built on our preferences or our desires but on the blood of Jesus Christ if we could find a way to do that in our church man that would be great amen move to the tables whenever you feel that